This is TWIS. This is a TWIS interview recorded on Tuesday, July 14th, 2015. Why are sea stars wasting away? Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki and this is This Week in Science with a special interview. Today we're going to fill your head with a conversation from, with Dr. Ian Hewson from Cornell University on the subject of sea star wasting disease. But first... I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening Happen this week in science. Well, hello everyone out there. Happy day of science and welcome to ev everyone to another episode of This Week in Science. It's a special twist interview and today we have a conversation with Dr. Ian Hewson. He's a microbial ecologist, marine biologist, biological oceanographer, all these titles but he works at Cornell University where he manages his lab, Team Aquatic Virus. Last year, with many other researchers, he published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on a possible cause of a phenomenon called sea star wasting disease, which we're going to discuss today. Welcome to TWIST, Ian, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. I love that intro music. <laughs> thank <laughs> <Fantastic>. you. <laughs> Yeah, we try to have a lot. We try to have fun, even when there are serious topics uh, that we're discussing. So um, I was going to start this show off by finding out, Blair, you originally brought this story to us um, when the paper was published. And can you give us the 30-second synopsis of what we're going to expect today and why you think it's important to talk about? Yeah, definitely. So back in November when this story hit, I got really excited because for months we had been reporting on these sea stars wasting away along the Pacific coast and all of a sudden it turns out there were all these different theories. Maybe it was climate change, maybe there was a bacterial infection. It looks like in this huge collaborative effort led by Ian's Cornell lab, it was a virus. And what was really interesting about it was that the virus was found in older specimens from other decades. And they didn't see the same kind of mass die off then as far as we can tell. So our big question now is, why is it happening now? Yeah, why is it happening yeah. now? That is a big question. So to get started, Ian, uh, to get some perspective on this. Can you tell us a little bit about the world of oceanic microbial ecology and what kind of a landscape you deal with when you're working on this kind of a study? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the ocean is absolutely full of marine, you know, of little bacteria, viruses, and little fungu fungus-like protozoa. Uh, in a single drop of seawater, what you're looking at is about a million bacterial cells all right, and there's about 10 million virus particles just in that single drop. So next time you're out surfing and you accidentally swallow seawater, remember that, okay? Uh, now the vast majority of those are infecting themselves, okay? So you have viruses that infect bacteria, bacteriophage. You also have viruses that infect the single-celled organisms that float around and fix a lot of carbon, uh, phytoplankton. And, uh, but there are also some of those which actually infect, you know, higher organisms, things like invertebrates, uh, like the sea stars as well as you and I, but they make up a tiny, tiny proportion of the total number of microbes that are out there. Uh, so they are naturally abundant organisms. They carry out very, very important functions in the marine environment. They do most of the nutrient transformations in the ocean. Uh, they take nitrogen from the atmosphere. They fix it into forms that plants can use. They take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and lock it up so that it sinks down to the deep ocean. Uh, and there's a huge diversity of them as well. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of species of bacteria and viruses and other types of microorganisms that inhabit relatively, you know, small volumes of seawater. So when you come across a, a, a problem like this, working with potentially a pathogen which might be causing a disease, it is a huge challenge to work out exactly who is responsible, what's different, you know. Uh, and, and so 
we can't just go in and say, oh, that's an animal virus. You actually have to look at all of the viruses. So all 10,000, 20,000 different species that are there, which is exactly what we did. Uh, the, uh, there's also you know, a huge diversity of pathogens out there, too, that we really have no idea what they are. Um, marine disease as a whole sort of field has only been in the last you know, 20 years at most that we started to appreciate that diseases are a natural part of the environment as well. Most disease events have gone completely unnoticed because people haven't been in the water. So uh, we, we believe that these are actually fairly common events. Why now? That's a good question. <laughs> Yeah. So can you tell us specifically what, it, what sea star wasting disease is and how you characterize it and um, what you've actually seen happening to populations of sea stars? Sure. Well, it started off uh, in about June of 2013. We had reports of uh, basically sea stars started to show what we're calling confusion. Essentially, they would entangle themselves in their own arms. So they, their arms would cross over. Uh, it led to the term pretzeling because they become a pretzel, like you know, with their arms kind of folded inwards. Uh, mm -hmm. They would become deflated, uh, so a sea star would lose all of its turgor, or the the water pressure inside of it, so it would actually deflate. Uh, we'd then start to see lesions on the surfaces of the sea stars. They'd have these little white uh, uh, spots, if you will, that grew, and uh, essentially it just looked very sickly. And then eventually, uh, their limbs would start to drop off and crawl away in different directions. Wait, and, the, lim uh, the limbs crawl away? <laughs> they do, yeah, exactly. So, so sea stars are sort of a fairly unique group of organisms in that they will drop a limb in response to stress. It, it's similar to your gerbil, for example, will drop its tail in case a predator comes along. Only in the case of sea stars, they can do it for almost all of their limbs. <laughs> okay. So essentially, these are fairly unique organisms uh, in, in the marine habitat uh, for being able to do that. Uh, what we've been seeing is that once the sea stars start to show symptoms, they die. They basically become a pile of goo on the ocean floor within about two days, up to about ten days. Uh, and in certain populations up and down the west coast, it's led to about a 95% decrease in the total number of sea stars present at a particular site. So you have this once upon a time very, very abundant predator, something that eats mussels, it eats other invertebrates, eats algae, suddenly gone. Okay, and that has had huge impacts upon the ecosystem, uh, so that a lot of their prey are starting to become very abundant. All right, so you can imagine that this disease has actually caused a huge sort of influence on the ecology of uh, those habitats in coastal waters. Um, and and it, the thing is, we've also had sea star wasting happen in the past and in different areas. Uh, back in the late 1970s, uh, there was a, a wasting disease event that occurred in Southern California and on the Channel Islands particularly. And essentially that's where very similar suites of symptoms, or signs as we call them because they're not self-reported, uh, they occurred in sea stars as well. In addition, uh, we've noticed that there have been sea stars dying off from a similar syndrome on the East Coast, uh, pretty much in the Gulf of Maine down to North Carolina. And when you talk to fishers in the region, they'll tell you that they've seen this happen every 20 to 30 years, that basically they'll become super rare, and then they'll become abundant again afterwards. It's unclear whether they're linked. We have no idea whether it's the same thing causing it in all of these different situations. Um, it's also unclear whether with the current event on the West Coast, we're dealing with one thing or we're dealing with multiple things that happen to have the same kind of symptoms. Uh, so, for example, sea stars are, and I don't want to use the word simplistic, but essentially there's only so many ways that they can die. Okay? They always show these stress-like symptoms of lesions, and then their limbs crawl away. And so it could be that in some places we're dealing with this pathogen, the sea star-associated densivirus, and in other cases we might be dealing with environmental stress. Uh, in the case of the 1970s, we believe that the event was caused by El Nino, where there was anomalously, anomalously warm water on the, on the shelf in California, which basically cooked them. Okay? Uh, similarly, on the West Coast right now, we're seeing certain small, shallow bays where the sea stars are all becoming very sick, and it's probably because temperature is rising, water's heating up as the day goes on, and they're all just basically cooking. All right? So disentangling what's actually causing a massive mortality event across such a huge geographic scale and what's causing it on local scales is is a challenge. Right. Wow. Yeah, it's it seems like it's uh, in the way that you're describing it, kind of like colony collapse disorder with bees, where this is something that it could be tied to environmental causes on a local level, but there could also be some larger global cause that uh, is is tying all these populations together in some way. 
Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that's a classic example of um, you know where we went into it with the expectation that there was probably one cause of the entire uh, you know incident that that occurred and this huge die-off of all of the colony bee colonies. Uh, and the early studies that were done actually did identify a virus that was causing that. It's called Israeli acute paralysis virus. That was very quickly um, basically there was a, a bunch of research done that showed that it wasn't simply that. Okay, that there were other environmental causes that were going on, everything from pesticides through to, I believe, some temperature change as well as other types of microorganisms that are involved in it. Very similar situation where we expect something, if we see a single species or a very closely related species all dying off at the same time, it's probably, you know, one thing, right? This is our human tendency to do that, but it's probably multiple different things interacting to, to cause that mass mortality event. Right. And so with the, the colony collapse disorder with bees, we obviously were very concerned because we need the bees for a lot of things and this is super unusual and we feel like we need to intervene somehow. It's not really clear how. Do Since this has happened with sea stars before, are we really concerned? Is this a crisis scenario? Is there, is there something that we can do to curb this or do we think this is just part of this natural cycle that happens every 20, 30 years? You know, it's very difficult to say at this stage. Um, certainly, leading up to the current disease event on the West Coast in 2013, sea star populations were uh, in what's known as a phase shift. So essentially, there was a huge abundance of very similar sea stars, particularly in the Salish Sea region, which is you know Vancouver, Seattle, uh, Puget Sound, and Strait of Georgia. And uh, having that large a number of relatively limited sort of diversity, if you will, can lead to a pathogen coming through and just wiping everything out, as we've seen. And so it's just restoring it essentially to the phase that it was before it became so abundant. Um, we've always seen sea star populations bounce back. There have been some very long-term phase shifts that have occurred. For example, there was an unknown disease which caused uh, a large number of sea stars in the Galapagos to be... Um, you know, disappear fairly substantially. They're still there, it's just they're really, really low abundance. They're not functionally extinct by any means. Uh, similarly, a huge disease event that swept through the Caribbean in the early 1980s of the uh, spiny black urch in Diadema antelarum. All right, this is a disease event that wiped out about 90% of all of the sea urchins on the coral reefs in the, in the Caribbean, caused massive changes to the ecosystem. Basically, those urchins were responsible for maintaining the balance between corals and algae, which are overgrown, they eat the algae and allow the corals to persist. So 20, 30 years later, uh, they haven't recovered. So essentially the reefs have changed, there's been a permanent shift in the ecosystem, and the abundances of those diademas have not returned to what they were before. So it'll be interesting to see in the future whether uh, it does bounce back from you know, what it is currently. We are starting to have reports of large numbers of juvenile sea stars uh, on the west coast inhabiting areas that were previously occupied adult sea stars, so we know that they are coming back to a certain extent. Whether those remain healthy or not is another question. That's something that we're trying to keep an eye on. Uh, so I don't think, personally, I don't think that it's going to be, um, you know, they're disappearing forever. It is obviously very concerning when we see a large number of animals uh, disappear very rapidly as they have done. Uh, but from history, what's, what it's shown us is that they can go into small populations. Some will survive, some develop a, a resistance, if you will, and uh, they bounce back from those seed populations in the future. With, a, with this kind of a, a disease, um, what do we know about the immune immune systems of the sea stars? Is there anything? Do we know much about about it at all? Um, someone on our chat room is asking if we can vaccinate a sea star, and do they have an immune system that we could even work with? Should we find out exactly what the cause is? Yeah, they absolutely do. Uh, so sea stars are belong to the group known as deuterostomes, uh, which makes them closely related or clo more closely related to humans than they are to uh, perhaps uh, worms and, and, and mollusks and bivalves, that kind of thing. Uh, what that means is that there's been a fair amount of research done on the echinoderm immune system because it is so close to us that it gives us a good model to understand uh, how, what's going on in, inside humans. Um, as the actual immune system that it does have comprises a couple of different things. Firstly, there are antimicrobial peptides that are put out. These are just small protein stretches, amino acid stretches that basically prevent fouling of organisms or just stopping them from coming in uh, in the first place. They also have what are known as coelomocytes, which are little specialized cells that are put out from the sea star tissues that go around and essentially they gobble up bacteria 
or they gobble up viruses on the outside of the, the cells and basically make them inert. Okay, uh, and that's what we, that's one of the sort of focus of our work. Uh, some, a recent paper came out by Drew Harvell's group, uh, which was essentially looking at how those, the gene expression within those salamocytes change when these uh, sea stars are actually infected with the virus. Um, so they do actually have an immune system. We, in terms of inoculation, um, I have to sort of reflect upon strategies used to uh, basically get rid of the crown of thorns starfish, which is a giant Acanthaster plantsii. It's a coral eating star, it's a starfish sea star uh, in the Great Barrier Reef, a huge concern down there. And the only effective mechanism by which they've found to get rid of it is to inject it with ox bile extracts. And what that does is it actually causes this massive bacterial bloom within the animals and they just die from a massive bacterial infection. Uh, any particular uh, dive that they go on, they can vaccinate or inoculate with the same sort of thing as what you'd be looking to vaccinate sea stars, about 200 of them, something like that. And we're talking population sizes here of several tens of millions of animals. Okay, so it's just not practical to go out and inoculate large numbers of sea stars. Also, what we know from the history of pathogens is that usually they're self-limiting which means that essentially once they get to a certain extent in terms of an infection within the population, they run out of hosts or the contact rates between infected and healthy individuals become so sparse that they just can't transmit it anymore. Okay? And so I suspect what's going to happen is that rather than developing a genetic resistance to this virus or another pathogen, essentially just become rare enough that the pathogen disappears on its own. Uh, so there isn't really an effective way by which we can inoculate sea stars, but there are ways by which the sea star populations will interact with their environment, will become rare enough, and essentially uh, they'll, they'll become cured of it, would be how I would, I would suspect. That. Right, so it's just the, the natural population dynamics over time that eventually there's just not enough of them. That's right, no, <laughs> so exactly. exactly. They, can't, they just can't <laughs> spread the virus anymore. So. Exactly. With uh, with the, the idea of the vi with IDing of the virus, can you tell us a little bit about how you went about actually determining that there is a virus that you can link to what's happening in there in, with this wasting disease? Sure, absolutely. So this is a, a new approach. It came about about ten years ago. We've only really had the ability technologically to do this in the last ten years, as well as having the computer power to do it. Uh, what we do is essentially, we wanted to start off, we wanted to look at what was different between healthy sea stars and diseased sea stars in terms of the types of microbiology associated with them. So different types of bacteria, archaea, fungus like protists, etc. And so what we ended up doing was, uh, in terms of the viruses, so we, we ruled out bacteria because there really wasn't anything different between them, all right, nor for the uh, fungus like protists. And essentially, we then went to viruses. We extracted virus particles from their tissues by sticking them in a blender. And uh, basically, we used a series of filtration steps to take those viruses out, extracted their DNA, and then sequenced all of their DNA. All right. And when we looked at between the healthy and diseased animals, we found that there was, amongst a set of 28 different sea stars, 14 healthy and 14 diseased, there was this one virus called the sea star associated densovirus. It belongs to a group known as parvoviruses that infect things like dogs and cats and can affect humans as well. Uh, that was different. It was only in the, uh, in the diseased and not so much, still there, not so much though, in the, in the healthy. So armed with that, we wanted to go out and basically find out whether on a population level this was associated with the disease. And so what we did is we solicited samples from all up and down the West Coast, healthy and diseased, uh, and we got about 600 of those samples into the lab. Or, sorry, it was about 450. We're up to 600 now. And uh, essentially, we established that this disease, this virus, in terms of its abundance within the host population, was more associated with the disease than it was with the healthy animals at all. And for various reasons, we think those animals that were healthy, that actually had the virus, were what's known as preclinical infection. In other words, they um, were infected but not yet showing symptoms. It's kind of like your uh, people with the flu who spread it around without knowing it. <laughs> right. So uh, same sort of effect. It is a challenge when you're dealing with a, a, a big sort of die-off event or potential you know, disease like this when you're already in the middle of it, okay, because you're always going to have you know, these populations that are subclinically infected and not, and, and that was certainly a big, uh, big issue for us here. So that's how we established that it was actually associated with 
the disease in terms of its prevalence as well as the total number of viruses within each individual. Uh, we then conducted an experiment uh, where essentially we took viruses out of a diseased animal. We then injected those into a healthy animal. And within about 7 to 14, 13 days, uh, those healthy animals became sick and died. Okay, so they started to show this disease symptoms and then they died. We wanted to confirm that that was, you know, real and it wasn't just the aquarium setting. We have controls for it. The healthy animals, just the ones that were not inoculated with the, the virus were fine after 14 days. So what we did is we actually took those animals that became sick in that first experiment. We got the viruses from those and then injected them into another healthy host. And the same thing happened. Okay, so it was like something is being propagated within those animals that we can then put into another animal and it will also become sick. Uh, this is what's satisfying what's known as, as Cox postulates, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a satisfaction of um, uh, uh, pathogenicity. So uh, that, would, that tells us that basically viruses are responsible for the disease symptoms, and that looking at those genomics and the statistical argument that we made that this C star associated dense virus is the most likely candidate for that, for the disease. So a long, long process, but we did it in a relatively short period of time. <laughs> We had to move very quickly. <laughs> and then didn't you find also that UV-treated water did not spread the disease? Uh, it, exactly. So that's what was one of the first clues that we had, that this was some sort of living agent as opposed to a chemical pesticide, you know, uh, some sort of other uh, toxin perhaps in the water. Uh, the aquariums in the West Coast, uh, we had three different independent observations that essentially uh, aquariums that are drawing in water from the outside world, <coughs> excuse me, when they actually um, filter it with ultraviolet light, uh, the sea stars were perfectly fine. But in aquariums that they also had where there's no ultraviolet light treatment, they were actually getting sick. And so that suggests that whatever it was, was susceptible to UV sterilization, which could mean basically that either it is, you know, uh, some sort of uh, molecule which is, you know, can be broken apart by ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of toxin which is highly unlikely, or it's a DNA-containing organism. So that's what gave us the idea that it was a virus. So Nice. And so when you were going into this, <coughs> it sounds like since you were in a microbial lab, you, ha you maybe had a hunch about this going into it. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, I'm a general sort of marine biologist. I'm also a microbiologist. My training is uh, as broad as sort of we used to work with invertebrates, fish, um, every, everything up to sharks, uh, for example. And so, uh, but we definitely had a hunch that this was a virus. I mean, my lab's called Team Aquatic Virus, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That actually, that hunch came from an early observation we made in Hawaii, believe it or not, which was about a year before our work in the west coast of the U.S. Uh, we had done the first ever survey of viruses inhabiting sea star, uh, sea, sorry, echinoderms, which is the group to which sea stars belong. And there we found this unusual group of densoviruses associated with this, uh, you know, the echinoderms. It's unusual because densoviruses prior to that only being seen in cockroaches, in crickets, and in other types of arthropods, you know, crustaceans and that kind of thing. So this was actually of interest to us, and we were, at the time, looking to expand our understanding of what types of viruses inhabit sea stars. And that's where, essentially, we had all of the pipelines in place. We knew that we could do this comparison very quickly, and uh, it worked out. Uh, we also looked at bacteria. We also looked at, as I mentioned, fungus like protozoa. We worked with histologists to do thin sectioning of the animals to see if we could see anything gross morphologically mm -hmm. uh, associated with it. But in all of those cases, uh, they, it didn't turn up anything. So it, it was the virus is our best candidate that we have, for sure. <laughs> And is there any connection, we talked a little bit about, um, about environmental causes, there are definitely, there have been other groups who have been exploring the envir possible environmental link. Um, are you finding any uh, connection between dead zones along coastal areas and, these, and, and the prevalence of these kinds of, di of diseases? Um, so, you know, dead zones, uh, there is at least one event in the Gulf of Mexico where a large number of Luidia, which is a type of striped sea star, was washing up uh, along the shores of Alabama. Uh, we were sort of asked to look into it, and it was almost definitely associated with the oxygen minimum or dead zone that was occurring off the coast there as part of the Louisiana, uh, sorry, Mississippi River plume. Uh, along the west coast of the U.S., uh, particularly in the Puget Sound, there can occasionally be sort of dead zones. 
but they're more common in summer periods. Uh, we saw this disease progress very rapidly in winter. Uh, we also uh, saw it spread to new areas in winter, and you know it just didn't fit the pattern of being associated with with any of those low oxygen kind of environments. Uh, pH was another thing that we were intrigued about. There didn't seem to be wholesale uh, changes in pH that corresponded with this disease event at all. Uh, temperature, as I mentioned, it actually got um, you know more intense and it spread to new areas as the waters cooled. Uh, in fact, in the last year, we've had reports that the sea star wasting diseases all but disappeared from the Olympic coast of uh, Washington State uh, in the summertime, whereas in the winter it was actually pretty, you know, extensive out there. So. If there is a relationship to temperature, pH, or other environmental changes, it doesn't appear to be a universal one. So it's not as though the virus plus temperature equals disease uh, in all cases. So um, there's also, you know, a possibility of we looked into whether there were any new pesticides being put out from urban areas, any new things being used by councils. There, there wasn't really any new pharmaceuticals. Uh, we couldn't really trace it to anything like that. Um, one of the aspects that we're hoping to look at in the future is actually cyanobacterial toxins, which are essentially a new uh, observation made by some researchers uh, that essentially you can detect some cyanotoxins in marine organisms, even though cyanotoxins are typically freshwater. Uh, and so we're, we're keen to see whether we can actually detect those out there as well. But uh, historically looking back, I can't really think of a situation where that could have affected them so, so many different places. So it seems like there are local you know, interactions with physical and uh, chemical changes, but on the whole broad scale, uh, there's nothing consistent between all of it, which, you know, as we're talking about, the colony collapse disorder is a very similar sort of situation uh, as this, where there's sort of localized impacts of environmental change and, uh, you know, global phenomena that are perhaps more conserved. So with your research, where are you going to go from here? Well, we're going to the West Coast, um, <laughs> definitely. Um, so in March of this year, uh, we wanted to, a key thing that we've been looking at is whether we can identify a population of sea stars that lack the virus and lack the disease entirely. At present, it extends pretty much from Homer, Alaska, all the way down the coast to the U.S.-Mexico border and perhaps beyond, but we don't have a lot of monitoring going on south of the border there. Um, so we actually took an expedition to Dutch Harbor on, on Alaska Island in the state of Alaska, out on the Aleutian Islands, which is about a thousand miles away from the Kenai Peninsula. We also went to Kodiak, Alaska, which is just south of the Kenai Peninsula, and we took samples of sea stars out there. We made observations of uh, the health of the sea stars, and I'm really happy to report that at the time they were totally healthy. Uh, we didn't see any of them. We also assayed for this virus. It appeared not to be there. Uh, speaking with some of the crab fishers in the region, uh, particularly around Kodiak, they said that in some of the waters near Kodiak, they're starting to see some funky looking sea stars. So we're actually going to go out again in September, uh, sorry, perhaps earlier, uh, and collect some healthy sea stars from way out on, uh, on Alaska Island or perhaps even further in Adak, uh, which is the furthest west you can get in the U.S. before you get to Russia and uh, essentially take those sea stars back to containment facilities here in Ithaca as well as at the Seattle and Vancouver aquariums and then from there we'll have at least a population that we can, can perform more high resolution experiments than what we've done in the past. We're going to look at things like environmental change. We can also look at um, what the other types of microorganisms are doing along that same you know, disease time course. All right. Right. Is so, there is there a change in the populations uh, and their and their prevalence within individuals and how that yeah. might be affecting the disease progression? Yep. And what happens to you know bacteria at the same time? We don't have a good temporal resolution on that. We know that certain yeah. types of bacteria were elevated. We don't know at what stage the animal starts to show shedding of the virus. Uh, another key question that we have that we're going to try and address is does the virus actually move around with larvae? So these are broadcast spawning mm -hmm. organisms. They release eggs and sperm into the water column. They swim around for about five to ten weeks, and then they settle. And uh, is it possible that the virus is being moved around on the larvae, which are moving around in ocean currents? Uh, so we're going to be doing some experiments and looking in the field at, at larval sea stars, which should be fun. And uh, so there's a lot to do. We're also going to look historically through time, and we have this beautiful... Uh, collection of sea stars in, pub, in uh, museums up and down the West Coast. We've worked very closely with the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. We're hoping to move that into other museums as well. 
And uh, one of the things that we can do is we can actually look at the full genome of the C star associated denso virus. It's not particularly big, and see whether there's been any mass changes in its DNA sequence, which could correspond with the current event. And that would tell us whether there has been a mutation or something else that's made it more virulent. Uh, so there's a lot to go on in the future. We're very excited to be uh, continuing this research. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have more to, to bring to you <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it, it's so fascinating. I mean, you've mentioned a, a few times talking to fisher fishermen, to crabbers, to people who are living out on the water and catching these organisms, seeing them on a regular basis. Um, and we've also heard stories um, of uh, scientists learning about, say, the history of Australia from talking to the Aboriginal peoples. Um, you know, how how much can you get historically from maybe adding in what what these people have seen? over years. Oh, we can, we can learn so much from them. Um, you know, really, with this current disease event, we have been relying a lot on citizen science groups, fishers, uh, folks, the crab fishers uh, in the Puget Sound region, um, also recreational divers. Um, you know, recreational diving wasn't a big thing about 1985 or whenever the last big disease event was. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now we have more diving going on in the Puget Sound than, you know, you, you go along the shore on a Sunday and it's just full of people in the water. Uh, so having the history that those people are, are saying, what they've been, you know, on the lookout for without, or perhaps noticed without even, you know, knowing about it, has been incredibly valuable to, to tracking it. Um, even these, uh, the crab fishers in the, near Kodiak Island, for example, and up into the Bering Sea for that matter, um, they see them a lot in their crab pots that they bring up, these big traps. Um, they are able to say, well, yeah, they look funny, you know, and um, so essentially, very, very valuable resource. Uh, also, you know, just the anecdotal reports that we receive from people along the intertidal zone. So the public has been reporting disease occurrence as well as severity at certain locations to um, some publicly available uh, websites and uh, really given us a complete picture of what the disease and how geographically extensive this disease really is. Um, and uh, certainly we are also talking to some scientists who were not directly working on but certainly did notice those previous disease events on the Channel Islands uh, in Southern California because they have a very good handle on how fast it moved, um, how extensive it was, even before concerted efforts to document it were, were underway. So uh, yeah, definitely we can learn from the public and we definitely learn a lot from talking with folks who are in the field but perhaps not scientists and um, you know, keep it coming. <laughs> Great. And so if I come across a wasting sea star on my tide pool trip, uh, is there somewhere I should be sending that information? How can I participate? Yes, no, absolutely. So there's the, um, the multi-agency Rocky Intertidal Network, or Marine. Uh, they've been coordinating citizen science efforts. They're, they're online. Uh, perhaps we can post the web address later. And uh, basically they collect reports of, you know, uh, sea star wasting disease uh, at different locations. So you can actually go onto that website and tell them, you know, where did you see it, uh, how many did you see, what proportion of them, uh, if that information's there. But really any sort of reports are very valuable. Uh, and I believe also there's a mechanism by which you can take a photograph with your cell phone or, or something and just, you know, take some, you know, so we can get the stage of the disease as to, as to what it looks like. Um, but certainly, you know, we know that the disease is very, very widespread right now, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we are sort of beyond this, the stage at this, at this moment of, you know, where's the disease? You know, so as we, unless it spreads to new areas, which it's likely to do, um, you know, we know that it's in California and Oregon and Washington, uh, but knowing about the severity of the disease is certainly very, very useful. So I uh, definitely encourage the public to contribute that information to Marine, and, uh, and that will help us out a, a great deal with where we should be targeting our, um, our sampling. Amazing. And so it also sounds like the jury's still out. You're hopefully going to figure out in the coming months to years how much humans have had an impact on this whole event. And so is there anything that we can do in the day-to-day -to, -day to help out these sea stars that are having this weird occurrence? <laughs> well, um, certainly, you know, there's no question uh, whatsoever that the, the oceans are changing. And uh, certainly the, the planet's changing as a whole. And uh, really, I think if we're looking at an impact of humans upon the sea star you know, disease event, it's probably from a whole you know, global perspective and the whole ocean perspective. So 
definitely sustainable practices, uh, definitely lowering carbon emissions if you can, uh, and, and also avoiding anthropogenic pollution to the coastal zone all help with reducing the stress on marine organisms and preventing, you know, uh, what might be an additional stress upon their populations leading to their decline. So even though we don't have a direct link with climate change or other, you know, aspects of uh, human pollution at this stage, we can all do a bunch to actually, you know, uh, reduce our impacts generally upon the marine environment, which I think would, would absolutely help. But uh, certainly, um, yeah, that's, that's something we should all be thinking about. <laughs> awesome. So as we, as we leave uh, and we think about the sea stars, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today, Ian. It's just been wonderful to find out about your research, to find out about the resources that people can use uh, to be able to help you and, your, and others in the re research efforts. Um, and we look forward to hearing more about the work that you're doing. I'd I can't wait to find out that you have, you know, answered this question once and for all. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, just this step in the process was so exciting for me. I'd been following this for years at this point and just so curious. It was the greatest who done it in a while I think in the biological realm and that was so cool to find out that it was this sneaky little virus. <laughs> I will share with you one thing uh, if I may. So most recently we had a review come back from our National Science Foundation uh, proposal on which our new project is based and one of the comments was your proposal reads like a CSI script. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, there you go. It is a detective story. I love it. <laughs> Perfect. And maybe at some point we'll, you know, we'll watch the movie or the TV show, and it'll That's be good. Six-part yeah. documentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, if anybody in the audience is interested in finding out more about sea star wasting disease, another website you can go to is seastarwasting.org. It's a website run by UC Santa Cruz. You can also look for Team Aquatic Virus online and uh, look for the Houston Lab at Cornell. Uh, for more information, or if you are interested in contacting Dr. Hewson. Is there anything more that you'd like to add that we maybe haven't covered about this research before we go, Dr. Hewson? No. no, thank you very much, and thank you to the public for your, your help with this. This is really uh, very helpful to all of us, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, once again, just I know this is going to be a this is a complex problem, and it's going to take many years to probably really get to the bottom of it. But thank you for doing the work so far. This is great. Pleasure. Thank you. And everyone out there, thank you for your support on Patreon. If you're interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Also remember that you can help us out simply by telling your friends about twists. We're going to be broadcasting live online this Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific time, twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room. Woohoo! But don't worry if you can't make it. You can always find past episodes at youtube.com. Look for This Week in Science or twist.org. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just search for This Week in Science in iTunes, or if you have any sort of mobile device, you can look for Twist for Droid in the Android Marketplace or for This Week in Science in the Apple Marketplace. For more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website, twist.org. You can also make comments there, start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put T-W-I-S in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on Twitter. We are at twistscience, at Dr. Kigi at Jackson Fly and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address or a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. We hope that you'll join us once again during our regular episodes for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. 
This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up a shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. 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 Thank you for joining us, Dr. Hewson. My pleasure. Thanks so much for that. That was great. You're welcome. <laughs> That was a awesome. great conversation. Yeah. Cool. Well, hopefully, we have more for you in the future. <laughs> Yay! I look forward to it. We all look forward to it. So, have a wonderful afternoon. We won't keep you any longer, and no look forward to hearing from you at some point in the future. Great. Thanks very much. We'll talk Thanks. to you soon. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Let's see, how do I get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> Click the little oh, hangout yeah. button. Hang up the little telephone. Oh, a little hang up. Oh. There <laughs> Click. <laughs> He's gone. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Now, now we've got a, a, a different little post show right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everybody for watching. If you caught this live, um, it was a really that was a really fun interview. Thanks for suggesting that interview, Blair. It was good. Yeah. Glad we were able to do it. I was glad too. That was it was very Enlightening. Ian's very interesting too. He has a lot of interesting stuff to say. I had had yeah, an original yeah. back and forth with him just because when I was working at the aquarium, there were lots of people asking questions about sea star wasting disease and the link to climate change. Right. And yeah. so I emailed him just a very quick question about it. And he gave me this very in-depth, like he obviously took t a lot of time to kind of lay this out for me in this broad spectrum of, you know, very layman stuff and then also some more deep explanations of what was going on. And I was able to disseminate that to my staff and it was so cool That's great. to have yeah. it from the guy who figured it out. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, very often, I mean, it, it might have helped that you were writing from an aquarium, but very often, you know, being able to get information like this from scientists who are doing the work. There are a lot of scientists out there who who will take the time and actually talk to you. And it's neat, neat to be able to get talking to them. So it was nice. Hey, recording sounds great today. Thanks, Identity4. Huzzah. Awesome. Huzzah. Yeah, so yeah, me just on a quick note about my audio issues. I have this, I've had a, a ground loop with hiss forever and it's really been bothering me. And so I finally, I've had to just unplug my preamps which just is bothering me because they're nice preamps and they make it sound all pretty. Yeah. I, I would rather have no preamp and sound and no hiss. So I'm going to have to figure this out somehow. Hmm. Ground loops. <laughs> anyway, that's science. That's like, you know, electricity and stuff that I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is reminding me of physics. Yeah. Audio sciences, the physics of audio. Yeah. AP physics, grounding and... Oh, yeah. and circuits and circuits and um let's see so tomorrow night's show mm -hmm. i have not gotten an interview or someone to be on the show yet i'm going to see what i can do about uh getting somebody to talk about pluto horizon oh right that whole yeah. thing that whole thing you know taking pictures of pluto and stuff right it's amazing it's amazing so we i just to, saw you guys we went to pluto today yeah, I just saw on uh, on Twitter that some of the NASA scientists have already started informally naming certain spaces on Pluto. Oh, that's cool. Now that they know <laughs> and, they're there. Yeah, and so yeah. like one has an arrow pointing to it and it says Cthulhu. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the, the fun that scientists have. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm sure they'll all be named after, I don't know, um, uh, uh, mythological characters or maybe even private funders heavens knows but for now it's pretty funny the stuff that they're they're naming i'm trying to pull it up now because i lost it um funny. 
Oh my gosh, there's some really funny stuff already on the internet about it too. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> where did it go? Yeah. Yeah. The Chuthu is the only one I remember off the top of my head, but I'm trying to find the picture. It wasn't three hours ago. It was like one hour ago. Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Mm. Let's see. Should we do, uh, let's see. Who should we do? Who should we do? Should we, we could see if Scott Lewis could join us. I could see if Fraser Kane could join us tomorrow night. I could see if, who else is a cool? I could see if Astro Engine could join us tomorrow night. Alactawala, mm, she would be great. She's probably busy though. I don't know. Um, nighttime. They might not be busy. Yeah. Nighttime on a Wednesday. It's possible. I don't know. I can't find it. Yeah. I give up. Let's see if I can find if I see if I can get these people on. Just to talk for a little bit about New Horizons. Tomorrow. <laughs> Balrog. John R. Sports says search for Balrog. B-A-L-R-O-G. Why? <laughs> Ew. What? Oh, sorry. I just saw a tweet come in. Donald Trump is leading the GOP in a new uh, USA Today Suffolk poll. I don't even understand. That would that. never happen. It's it'll mm. never happen. That, I don't even understand that. It won't happen. No. No. Oh, uh, as, let's see. Astronomy Mag says Pluto and Sharon show craters, dark spots, and even signs of snow. And if you haven't seen, it's blurry, but oh my goodness, it's so pretty. There are so many colors. I mean, these are colorized images, obviously. Um, but color, color images. This is, there, there is a very vibrant surface of Pluto. It's it, there's so much more there than, you know, what we once upon a time saw in the blurry image so far away from us. So interesting. What I love is like today, today completely changed our perspective on Pluto. Getting these and for the next year we're going to be getting data back and yep. and w w what used to just be this, you know, odd little object billion miles away from earth you know is is now much more complex much more interesting i don't know i vote we turn it back into a planet <laughs> um didn't they already do that no they haven't uh, they i thought haven't. they i it's thought they dwarf, like it's a dwarf planet oh so right, right right considered a dwarf yeah. planet okay yep yeah because it was downgraded even more than that before, wasn't it? Yeah. So. I don't know. What might be really interesting, you know, it seems like, so Sharon is the big moon orbiting Pluto, but it's more like Pluto and Sharon, Sharon are a binary system and mm -hmm. that they have moons orbiting them. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It's, it's just it's interesting. There's so much... And then there are other moons. It's so interesting. There's new things. We're learning new stuff. We traveled a billion miles. Uh, and a gazillion, a even. Gaz <laughs> even a gazillion. Um, yeah. yeah, I think about kids that are in, like, early elementary school now. That by the time they start really learning about the planets, they'll know so much. I know. They're Just based on what happened today. I know. I I asked when I was a kid, what does Pluto look like? What's on Pluto? And the answer was, uh, we're not sure, but probably nothing. <laughs> right? And when they when you have pictures of it, it's just like this it's a ping pong ball. It's just a white ball. It's like, oh, 
there's Pluto. But we're going to have so much information about Pluto now. And that's just part of the knowledge of our solar system that we have. Yeah. And it's because of this. I think it's it's like it's almost it's almost cheering me up a little bit. It's so cool. It's so cool. It's it's so the cool. Power, the power of as much as I get down on space exploration and I feel like, oh, we should be spending money on what's here, which I also agree with. Looking, also, more, looking more at the oceans, for yes, instance. Yes, the oceans and the deep sea trenches are mm. not explored enough. There's still so much merit to this and it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to completely change it's going to change what we know about the solar system. It's also probably going to excite some kids into, into science in as a whole and definitely into space in a way that they might not have if they didn't know everything that we will know about Pluto. Yeah. Pretty cool. Very cool. And I mean, I'm excited too. After Pluto, it's off into the Kuiper belt and to explore other objects out beyond Pluto, you know, this is yet another craft that is going, going the distance. It's, so. yeah, this is the part where you almost feel like the future is now, right? Mm -hmm. Like we don't have our teleporters, we don't have our flying cars, I don't have my hoverboard, but, <laughs> but we have so many things that are coming our way that, that future generations are going to, take for granted just like we have things now that we take for granted like our computers in our pockets yeah but it's gonna yeah it's gonna totally change the landscape of an, an astronomy class <laughs> it's gonna be completely different it's gonna be so different yeah not every day that we get to go to pluto so yay oh yay humans that's it's awesome. pretty awesome it's pretty so amazing awesome. So let's do more study in the oceans so that we can find out about things like this wasting disease. Is it, you know, is it like an every 20 year kind of thing? Does it just pop up or is it, yeah. is this what, is this one a bad one? Yeah. And why? We need to know more why? about that. Yeah. So for the entire time until this virus was fingered, pointed out, I was convinced, as I'm sure you can find previous episodes of me climate ranting. Change. It's climate change. pH. I really thought pH. it was going to be pH linked. I yeah. really thought it was. And it's not related to ocean acidification as far as we can tell. Yep. It's not. Yep. Which, it's, Which is kind of good. Yeah. It's a very <laughs> good thing because it means that it's possible that this is not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> one and that thing makes, that's that makes not you our happy. fault. Yeah. One thing that's not our fault. Also, that probably means sea stars are going to be fine. It's not like the colony collapse disorder with bees, where if we don't do something about it, m much of our food is just going to disappear and we're screwed. Yeah. It's not like that. If if it's really not our fault, considering sea stars have been around for hundreds of millions of years, and this virus has probably been around close to that long, we'll probably be okay. The sea stars are probably not going to disappear and our oceans will not, the food webs won't collapse. I think we'll be okay. Yeah, that'll be good. And yeah, yeah and hopefully they don't find that this is spread via um, the larvae. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully this is the sea star disease is something that is individual to individual or just being in a location where mm -hmm. the virus is building up. Um, and hopefully it's not larvally spread because if it's not, then that, that especially indicates that populations will be fine. Yeah. If it is ballast water, real problem. Yeah, exactly. Because then you're spreading things with disease as disease vectors into places yeah. where they haven't been before. We're going to have to start mm -hmm. casing our ballasts and our ships with like UV light, <laughs> UV bulbs, so that they can yeah. blast the water. That's, I mean, why not? That's a great we idea. We should be doing that anyway we because then, be. then like zebra mussel problems wouldn't happen because we'd be killing all these little... If um, they're sensitive to the UV. Yeah. Yeah. UV kills a lot of things. It does. 
Yeah. So it would be nice if we could do that just so all the little planktonic larval stages of things that we might be spreading accidentally, we can just zap them. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. That's good. All right. Well, I need to get going. Yeah. Yeah. Another, another meeting and things to do today. Yep. And, uh, and we'll we'll chat more in the after show tomorrow. But I want to um, maybe put a post up on the Twist site so that if anyone is in Texas, yep, I'm there. We can I can see if there's interest in a in a hangout and a meetup. And if there is, then I yeah, can facilitate that. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then also probably I'll need some stickers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. I should probably yeah, get on mailing things to you soon. Okay. Yeah. I'm Perfect. leaving in, in less than two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Huzzah. In my timeline. Huzzah. Yay. Great. All right, everybody. Okay. Thank you for joining us for our special twist interview today. Uh, join us again for more twists on Wednesday nights. And Blair, thanks for doing the interview with me. I'm glad that you brought this to the show. Thank you. This was super fun. Yeah. It was really good. All right. Have a great one. We'll see you soon in science land. Oh, wait. How do I turn this off? <laughs>